Well, good morning, everybody. Let's go ahead and get started with Thursday's medal call of this week. Very excited to have another wonderful presenter today, and thank you so much for joining us. For those of you that are not familiar with metal, metal is a regional coalition of the communities in Manhattan, Emporia, Topeka, and Lawrence Chambers. Metal was formed because the leadership of these four chambers felt there was a need for a regional voice for business. We believe that the four metal chambers represent a reasonable and important voice. And in addition to our common interests, the metal coalition represents nearly 3,000 businesses. Our motto is stronger together. And together is exactly how we're going to come through this challenging time. To that end, we are pleased to have chamber leadership and interested members from each of our four metal communities on today's webinar. These webinars will be held on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 11 a.m. for the next several weeks. And while we, do, while we do have a maximum capacity of 500 participants, these webinars are being recorded and will be made available the same day through the metal chambers and other local stakeholder channels. With that brief introduction about our group, let's get into today's topic. We are very pleased to have Wayne Bell. Wayne is the district director of the Wichita office of the U.S. Small Business Administration, and he's been there since 2008. Wayne will provide us an update on current federal funding programs and a general update on COVID-19 relief efforts for businesses. We have a set of questions that were posed to us prior to this broadcast, so we will address those. And I encourage you to ask your questions at the bottom of the screen on the Q&A section. Click on that and type your question and those will be posed to Wayne. So now, Wayne, in the interest of time, I won't go into a detailed biographical introduction this morning, which is quite impressive, I might say. I'll just say that we're very pleased with how responsive you and your team have been. And thank you so much for making yourself available this morning. I will turn over the presentation to you and I believe you have a, an update on funding programs. So with that, Wayne, thank you so much. I'll turn it over to you. All right, thank you very much, Bonnie. Um, really appreciate you and, and your team. Uh, certainly, uh, uh, Steve Kelly, uh, he's reached out to me a few times here over the past uh, month uh, about perhaps getting on the agenda to share a bit of information with your group, uh, the chambers represented here. So um, always a good opportunity for us to, to share and, and provide a, a few updates. I do have a few slides uh, that I want to bring up. Uh, but before I get there, I, I want to make sure I have all of the chambers that are represented here. Uh, you said Manhattan, Topeka, and Lawrence. What was the fourth area? Emporia. Emporia. Excellent. Excellent. All right. So, uh, again, great to, uh, great to be on uh, with everyone. Uh, bear with me. I'm just going to bounce over really quick. I've got just a few slides we're going to go through. Uh, really, we've had, uh, as, as you all know, I'm going to assume that most of the participants are aware of the uh, lapse now in appropriations for our disaster relief funds uh, that have been in, in play for the coronavirus pandemic. And I'm talking about the Paycheck Protection Program, as well as the economic injury disaster loans that were both uh, specific, specifically in place as a result of uh, the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, so anyway, I'm gonna bounce over to a few slides. We'll talk about a few things and then we'll go, go to questions if that's okay. Okay, are you seeing this okay, Bonnie? Everybody seeing this okay? Yes. Yes, we are. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so again, um, with the U.S. Small Business Administration, uh, federal agency, as everyone knows, the agency was actually established in 1953. We have a direct link uh, to our state as President Eisenhower actually established the SBA back in 1953. Uh, you touched briefly on my background just for the sake of, of the audience and those that may not have heard. Uh, I've really been in, in Kansas all of my professional career. 
I had the opportunity to go to school at Wichita State, I uh, graduated with a bachelor's in industrial technology some years ago, uh, and then back uh, around 2003, I finished up an executive MBA at Wichita State. Uh, it's been my great opportunity to serve in public service here now for 17 years plus. Uh, and also, I've been in private industry in the area, started out uh, right out of college at Beach Aircraft, uh, stayed in the aircraft industry really for that uh, first 15 years of my career and then transitioned over into federal service. Now just a little bit more about SBA, more broadly some of the things that we do or that we're involved in. Uh, we're probably best known for our various loan uh, products. Uh, we work very closely with lenders. And we'll talk about that uh, a little more here, but when a applicant or a business owner gets a small business loan, uh, today, the way that process works, they basically are working with a lender and virtually all commercial lenders in the state have agreements in place to utilize SBA loans. Uh, when you think of an SBA loan, it's almost like a it's almost like an insurance policy against a commercial loan. It's like it's a it's a government guarantee against this loan, and and so uh, it's really been, I think, a very uh, it's been ingenious the way that it works because now every commercial lender again has access to our programs, which one of the things that it kind of dem demonstrated here recently with the Paycheck Protection Program, we could rapidly get funding out to um, borrowers in the business community through these hundreds of outlets that were commercial lenders. Um, had the process been uh, the way that it had been maybe some 20 years ago where borrowers literally had to work directly with SBA field offices on every loan, uh, this really would have been a problem given uh, it, it, it would have it would have made it more complex and a bit more of a hurdle you know for for borrowers to have obtained capital so in in this instance uh, being able to utilize the banking industry and all of those commercial lenders and uh, that that really I think helped to streamline the process in terms of uh, borrowers getting capital that they desperately needed and anyway, that's a bit about how we work. Some of the other programming that we have, uh, obviously we work very closely with business owners and helping them assure up their plans for growth and expansion. We've got a network of resource partners that we work very closely with, the Kansas Small Business Development Center and uh, their, their sites all around the state. Work very closely with KSBDC. We work very closely with SCORE SCORE is a national nonprofit that receives its funding in part from the SBA. Um, uh, so SCORE has volunteer members that also provide business counseling, and technical assistance uh, to business owners and uh, those looking to start a business. And then we work very closely with the Women's Business Center. I believe it's located over in, uh, in the Kansas City area. Uh, there are women's business centers all around the country that are funded in part by the SBA. Also, we work with Veterans Business Resource Centers. Uh, these are centers that have a, a niche focus where they're working with service members and veterans on their plans uh, to grow uh, their businesses. And then finally, in the area that I think I'd like to spend a, a bit more time or most of our time on today has to do with disaster recovery. SBA has a unique role when it comes to helping our communities recover from a disaster that's been declared as a disaster uh, by the governor uh, or the president. Uh, and then uh, ultimately, SBA's administrator will deploy resources uh, to impacted communities to help in the event of a disaster. And uh, going back uh, to this current uh, situation, Governor Kelly signed our disaster declaration in place for Kansas. I believe it was back around March uh, 31st, and very quickly afterwards, uh, the SBA, uh, the SBA's administrator, um, deployed resources uh, to uh, help, you know, our state uh, begin uh, to recover. And um, so, anyway, we'll we'll talk a bit more about about P 
PPP and, and the economic injury disaster loans that came into play as a direct result of the disaster declaration for Kansas. I want to show you uh, th these numbers uh, that you're seeing right now represent the payroll protection program funds that were dispersed as of Monday, April 13th. I do not have the numbers uh, as of today, but, but I do know that as of early this morning, uh, the agency has reached its limit in terms of the, the number of uh, funds that were appropriated for the Paycheck Protection Program. But you can see that as of April 13, the number, uh, we had over 1 million loans that were done nationally and over $247 billion in loans that were supported. And that was as of Monday. By the way, that was just Right now, I think we're, we're roughly right around 14 days uh, into this uh, program being stood up. This chart, a little harder to read, but I think it's important to note for Kansas, and again, as of Monday, Kansas had nearly 20,000 payroll protection uh, program loans that were approved, and that total 3.7 billion dollars plus uh, for for Kansas. I, I suspect as of today we're probably somewhere around four billion dollars, maybe a bit above four billion dollars. We should have those final totals uh, just any day in terms of what um, how, you know in terms of that volume uh, for our state. Here's a chart that just reflects nationally. This is based on the national numbers, uh, what those loan sizes look like. A uh, good percentage of those loans, 70% uh, were, were below $150,000. Uh, you see that 725,000 in that size uh, loan had been approved as of Monday. And then it kind of goes from there. In terms of the industries that received uh, these payroll protection uh, loans, you know, widespread usage, by the way, a number of, of industries are reflected in, in all kinds of businesses that, and nonprofits, by the way, that were able to be helped by the payroll protection program. Uh, just a few to note, the construction industry and firms that were in the construction industry professional services, manufacturing, healthcare related. Uh, those are some of the most uh, high volume industries uh, that were reflected in our lending activity under that program. So uh, this slide here, just want to transition a second. In the state, the Wichita District Office actually covers two thirds of the state uh, from our office here in Wichita. We, we cover everything west of Shawnee County, and the Kansas City District Office covers everything east. Uh, so wanted to make sure I, I at least presented our two office numbers and everything for the audience here, understanding that a good percentage of the audience is going to be going to fall in either of the district territories. Um, so that is really just a quick walkthrough you know, at a really high level, uh, I would like to take uh, the remainder of our time to talk a little bit about the payroll protection program. Any, I'd like to answer any questions. I'd also like to answer any questions that you all may have relative to the economic injury disaster loans, and uh, and we can go from there. So, Bonnie, I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and and we'll go back to. Uh, just the just the video look here, if that's okay. Absolutely. Okay, we're we good now. Yes. All right. So, what questions? Uh, what questions do you have? Uh, perhaps there's some that have been submitted in the chat line, or I don't know how you all ordinarily do it. So, just. Uh, Take it away. Sure, and thank you very much for that information, Wayne. I will pose questions to you since this broadcast is being recorded, so everything will be uh, on audio for those listening to this presentation at a later date. 
We've been hearing this morning that there's some uh, challenges with funding, um, economic injury, disaster loans, and we'll refer to those as EIDL going forward, EIDL, and also the payroll protection program. Can you give us an update on, on those funding opportunities, Wayne? Right. Well, both of those programs, it's my understanding as of this morning, both of those programs have reached our limit for their appropriations. However, under the EIDL program, those applications that were in the works, uh, likewise under the payroll pr protection program, those applications that were in the works and that have already received an approval under the payroll protection program, but hadn't been dispersed, those disbursements are coming if they've already been approved. And under the EIDL program, likewise, there's some that are in process that are still yet to be dispersed. Uh, but beyond that, any of those applications that are submitted today, uh, unless that program re receives additional funding or those programs receive additional funding, um, they will not be, you know, those loans would not be uh, approved. Okay. Thank you for that. And I understand that you're, you're the messenger. Uh, so let's hope that those programs will be fully funded. So the questions that were posed uh, that I'll ask now is based on what the programs were before. So we're making a quantum leap assumption that the programs will continue in the future for new applications, um, assuming additional funds are provided. So I, I want to make that a little bit of a disclaimer. Well, but, I, I, I'd like to... I'd like to also add to your disclaimer there, uh, Bonnie, because here's what could come into play. The payroll protection program, having been a new program that was stood up just here in the last 14 days, we were receiving guidance and further clarity around policy just as recent as two days ago. I, I suspect there are going to continue to be modifications if that if that program is funded as is, then then certainly you know we would we would have a, a leg up on perhaps some of the questions that you have and and uh, but but I just want to put a qualifier out there with new legislation, there could be modifications to the program. And, and so I would prefer not to get too deep into the discussion of the program as is, because that program very well could be modified slightly. It may not be modified, but there's a chance there could be an expansion of uh, who is eligible, you know, for the, for that particular program. As far as the economic injury disaster loans, that historically has been a vehicle that's come into play when a disaster is declared and uh, SBA's resources are deployed. So the criteria for the economic injury disaster loans should be pretty consistent moving forward. I don't expect that program to see much change. We did see we did see a few modifications in recent weeks that led to the idle advance and the idle itself, or the economic injury disaster loan, and then there was an idle advance. So that was new under the uh, CARES Act, and uh, but I do suspect if these programs receive additional appropriations, I don't anticipate to see much change on the idle stuff. Um, there could perhaps be modifications, uh, but yet to be determined on the uh, Paycheck Protection Program. Thank you. We're, we benefit from your experience and expertise and knowledge, Wayne. We really appreciate that. We did hear from a local banker this morning who serves our four market areas for the Manhattan, Emporia, Topeka, and Lawrence areas. And they stated that they will continue accepting applications for the PPP loans. So I, I suspect, um, and I appreciate your comment on this, that if, um, if there are questions regarding that topic, that they should talk to their bankers. Would that be solid advice? 
Absolutely, absolutely. Um, keep in mind, our normal programming is still intact. It's still in place. So you still have access to other SBA loan products right now. And you can work with your lenders on those. Uh, again, we've, we've seen enormous participation, widespread participation through the payroll protection program. Many lenders that hadn't used this before are, are starting to utilize SBA. And uh, in addition, there are many active lenders uh, that, that have always utilized SBA. So there's great um, awareness of our programs and there are tools that can help. And those lenders that have participated in the payroll protection program, I think it's, I think it's wise to continue to work with their clients, their borrowers, or their applicants. Um, take those applications because the applications are actually made with the lender. It's just that SBA, we can no longer accept those applications at, uh, at, at this time due to the lapse in appropriations. But if that changes and the program stays intact, then those lenders that continued that activity of collecting those applications, those lenders would would very well have a leg up. Thank and they would be better prepared, you know, than than the others. Thank you for that clarification. I, I appreciate that, and I would encourage um, people involved in this program or interested in applying to stay in touch with your local chambers, and and we all will be posting updates. So we have a few questions for you, and these questions, uh, keep in mind, were mostly posed prior to today, uh, and some will be live. As I mentioned earlier, if you have any questions, please click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, and I will be asking Wayne those questions. So we have a question for somebody who said they have applied for a PPP loan, and they were authorized, but they've received nothing else. No money, no instructions. What should they do to get more of an update on what's happening with their request? Um, they, they need to work with their lender because the disbursement will come from the bank. Uh, the lender should have received an approval from the SBA. And uh, if they've received an approval from the SBA or an authorization from the SBA, then uh, they should have what they need to disperse funds. So I would communicate with the lender uh, to find out exactly what, to get more details around what uh, the status is of their, uh, of their loan. Thank you, Wayne, good advice. Next question. In the forgiveness section regarding reduction in forgiveness due to reduction in gross pay, so we're talking about the PPP loan, do you have to pay each employee 75% of the total gross pay they received in the entire previous quarter in order to avo avoid reject, excuse me, in order to avoid reduction or just 75% of their average weekly pay? <laughs> um, I'm going to take the easy way out on this one <laughs> uh, because that is, that one is you've got a nuance in there that I'm not really familiar with, but I'll say this, those payroll costs should equal at the end of the eight weeks. Um, it could be, and I know that there's a little bit of flexibility if an individual's or team member's wages have, have moderately decreased. Uh, if, you, if you have had to hire someone in the place of another, uh, so there, there's a little bit of flexibility there, but in total, you want those payroll costs to, to equal um, so that uh, you don't compromise or risk the forgiveness. It needs to be very, very close, if not equal, at the end of the eight-week term. Thank you, Wayne. The next few questions pertain to forgiveness as well. The law states that forgiveness will be allowed for expenses incurred and paid during the eight weeks. Our payroll for one week is paid to employees in the next week. Does this mean that in order to get the full eight weeks forgiven, 
we will need to move up that last paycheck date so that it also falls with, within the eight week period. I don't believe so. I think, uh, I, th I think the overarching thing is you need to, re you need to reflect those payroll records for the eight week time frame. And if their pay falls, you know, a, a week or two or a few weeks after the eight week time frame, again, you need to disclose and share that information with your lender. And the lender ultimately is going to submit those documents to the SBA for, for the forgiveness. Um, I believe our agency is going to have and, and going to exercise uh, great flexibility with this. Uh, and so all things being, um, you know, within the constraints of the program, those payroll costs are, are equal or nearly equal. Uh, whether that individual or your teams are paid, you know, slightly outside of that time frame, as long as you have those records, I don't believe that's going to be a problem at all. The idea is this, in the spirit of, of that program is this, to bring your team members back to work and to offset those costs uh, that the business would ordinarily have as a result of that payroll um, and demonstrating that you've had your teams on board for the eight week time frame um, and, and and having those pay records even if that pay reflects that you know they were paid a few weeks outside of that i believe the business owner is still going to be on, on solid ground for the forgiveness Wonderful. Thank you for that, Wayne. We can all understand that there's some anxious people out there looking at receiving funds now and what that means down the road. So definitely appreciate these questions. So the next one, forgiveness is available for covered utility payments, which includes telephone. Does that include business use cell phones that employees use for business or just landlines? You know, that's a, that's a great question, and I, I'm really not sure. I saw that question, but I didn't see the answer yesterday uh, from another district, the St. Louis District Office, and, and all of us are sharing information. I saw the question because it came from the office, and it was, it was an ask of how, other, how others have heard this is being addressed, and I don't recall seeing the answer, so... I want to be consistent. <laughs> I want to be consistent with our agency, and I don't want to give you bad information. Um, if if you could, Bonnie, I want to stay in communication, and what I'll do is I will email the answer to that question for sure uh, here pretty quickly. That's perfect, Wayne. Thank you. And I also want to request receiving a copy of the slides. Would it be available? Would it be possible for you to share that with us as well, so we can push that out to those interested? Yes, uh, absolutely. I, I'll share those slides, those numbers again, with the qualifier. Those were those loan numbers, high level, as of April 13th. So those aren't the final numbers, but they do give a little bit of a picture in terms of the activity, the, the industries that small businesses fell within, you know, that use the program. Uh, you can see total numbers by state. And I anticipate having similar numbers uh, that run through the full $350 billion. And then we'll see what that breakdown looks like. Maybe another week or two before we have those final numbers and those final percentages by state. But certainly, I'll, I'll share those slides just as soon as we're done here, Bonnie. I'll email those to you. Okay. Thank you, Wayne. And, and the, the Chamber's posting this information for that I mentioned. We'll make that caveat and, and show that so, it, so it's very clear to, um, to our members. Next question. Can we give our employees a temporary raise during the eight weeks to help with their family struggles and to enable them to obtain the extra $600 they can receive from federal employment? Well, what, uh, 
remember with the payroll protection program, the loan is based on uh, those factors that went into your individual uh, business's calculation. So I'll use that as an example. For most small businesses that had employees, it was the average monthly payroll using their the previous 12 months, it was the average monthly payroll multiplied by two and a half uh, to arrive at an amount. And there were, there were some other uh, factors, but that was, you know, the, the really the overarching methodology for the, you know, for the loan calculation. So your payroll cost that rolled into that, that average monthly payroll, you can certainly exceed that but not with the expectation that if you exceed that, that that excess is going to be forgiven. It really is going to be the loan amount. And if you meet the terms of uh, the payroll forgiveness, that loan can be forgiven. Um, but, but those costs in excess, uh, so as an example, if you hired above those numbers, that went into your average monthly payroll. If you hired above that, uh, that would not be a factor that would be forgiven. Um, and then that would be wonderful. And that's, that's the idea. The idea here behind this program, again, is to help the business to offset its payroll cost and to help the business to, to sustain operations so that you get back to a place where things are picking up again and you're able to, to continue your growth and your normal activity. Uh, so that would be, this would kind of be something that would help to jumpstart uh, the business to get back to a place where, you know, they've been economically uh, strong and healthy and, and um, continuing to grow. So, but those increases would not be forgiven. Okay, thank you for that, Wayne. I might remind our listeners, if you have any questions, to click on the Q&A button at the bottom and type your question. We'll try to fit in as many as we can. Next question, we were approved for PPP. My understanding is that if we were approved for the IDLE as well, then the amount of the forgiven advance money will be subtracted from the PPP forgiven amount. If the idle advance amount is less than PPP potential forgiven amount, is there a benefit of taking the idle advance money anyway? Well, there is definitely going to be an offset. So you, so you can't use the idle advance, which in this case right now, the idle advance is solely based on the number of employees you have up to 10 employees. Uh, so the Iowa advance goes up to $10,000. And for, you know, for, for a small company that has five employees, in theory, the Iowa advance would be $5,000. Um, and, and so that benefit, yes, there will be an offset from the payroll protection program because that payroll protection program, again, that's gonna be a forgivable benefit. And so you can't utilize both, you know, for the, for the same purpose. So yes, there will be an offset and the formula does in Wayne, you froze up on my screen. Can one of the other administrators see, um, hear Wayne speaking? No, he's frozen, you're right. Okay. So I have to give him a minute to thaw. Okay. I think he's signing back on. Okay. 
real quickly, I'll mention that these programs are Tuesdays and Thursdays for the mental webinar at 11 o'clock. Our next program on Tuesday will be um, sent to you in a link after this. Wayne, do we have you back? Yeah, I'm, I'm here. I don't know what, uh, <laughs> I don't know what happened. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you, not see you, but I think we can proceed if you're comfortable with that. Yes, I'm comfortable and I will try to bring up my video. Okay. Are we ready for a question? There you are. Can you hear yep. me? Okay. Yep. Are you ready for the next question? Uh, yes, and uh, did you catch all of that last answer? I think we did. Um, there may be some, uh, the end that uh, that was missed. So if you did ask that question and did not receive the full answer, please get a hold of, of uh, your metal representative and we will reach out to Wayne and, and fully answer that. Let's move on to the next question. If we use 75% for payroll, then we are for PPP obviously, then we are allowed to use the 25% for software systems can we do that? Or does it have to go directly for rent or something specific? Also, can we go over the 75% for payroll and still have the loan forgiven? You know, on the, uh, on the details of that 25%, it talks broadly in the, in the program. And in the, last, in the last few days, some of these specific questions, such as the, one of the previous questions we had about the uh, cell phones. Um, I'm, I'm just not, I haven't stayed abreast of some of those specific uh, details. I do know that broadly, rents were included in the 25%, um, mortgage interest, utilities. Beyond that, when you get into further detail, I'm just not sure, and, I, and I'd hate to say yes in error. So what I'm going to ask, Bonnie, is that we capture that question, and I will quickly get a response back by email, but I just hate to give you the wrong answer um, where, where I'm not 100% sure about those uh, specific expenses. That's certainly fair, Wayne, no problem. And again, we will share the information we received from you after this webinar with our members. You ready for another question? You need to take a break. No, I'm, I'm, I'm ready. <laughs> okay, okay. All right, here we go. Since we are waiting for the PPP loan to come through and we still, are we still able to file for unemployment before we sign for the PPP loan? At this point, it would have been a total of four weeks. We have not gotten paid. So can we file for the four weeks prior for unemployment and not get penalized? Yes. Yes. Um, okay. You know, it's intended to help you bring people back to work. Um, and, and that eight week window starts when the funds are dispersed. So yes, in that window that you know, you, you perhaps didn't have the capital, you know, to keep your folks on board. Um, yes, you know, many, many businesses that we've talked to were in situations where they had laid their teams off, but they were utilizing the payroll protection program to bring them back. So you can certainly do that. You're not going to be penalized. Just keep in mind, you've got a window of 10 days from disbursement. So when, that, when those funds are dispersed, within that 10 days, you need to have your teams or those, you know, those employees who made up your payroll, you need to have them back on board and then try to maintain that level over eight weeks. That's great. It's probably refreshing to have a definitive answer instead of working with all the, the fluid conversation and changing programs. So thank you for that. Here's the next one. I've been told that signing up for the, for the EIDL loan registers a business for both a $10,000 grant and is the first step in applying for a larger EIDL loan, like for my business with over $50,000 of revenue. The grant comes to my business bank account within days. 
However, you have to complete a longer application with the SBA for the $50,000 loan later. Just the single application for EIDL sets both the grant and the loan in motion. Is this true? I believe that is the case because when the EIDL program started, uh, you know, as a result of the coronavirus uh, disaster, you had a number of documents just three weeks ago. You had a number of documents that had to be submitted. Uh, there was tax information. Well, pretty quickly, due to the volume and the need to rapidly get capital out, the application went streamlined. And a part of that was idle advance. So I'm going to say yes. Um, what happens, here's how the process will work. So you'll be contacted at somewhere, somewhere here within, say, a three to four week window. You'll be contacted by a loan officer. That loan officer will go more in depth over your application. And uh, they'll have questions about your operating expenses, uh, things that you submitted, even on the streamlined application. And that will help them arrive at a proposed loan amount for your business. And, and what, the, what the idea is, is to give you enough working capital, uh, projected out up to six months of working capital to help the business to be sustained while we're dealing with this pandemic. So short answer to that question is a yes, because actually, if you go out to the disaster website, and, and now that application isn't even available, but we literally saw a change from the full-blown application that all of these documents were required to gradually a more streamlined version of the application which also work for idle, idle advance. I'm sorry. Uh, so yes, you're 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 dead on. Uh, that one application oh. should get you uh, down the path for the bigger need under idle. Okay, perfect. So a question posed this morning, and a couple idle loan uh, loan questions are coming up. I applied 11 days ago and received an application number. How do I check on the status of my idle request? Great question. There's a 1-800 number that uh, I will make sure that I include in my information to you, Bonnie. There's a 1-800 number. I don't have it uh, close enough to recite, but they're, they, they've hired customer service representatives or they've staffed up. So they can, uh, I've, I've heard, you know, some of the challenges that we've had early on with the volume, wait times on the customer service line were in excess of, of two hours. Today, I think you're probably about an hour on wait time. And I know that, you know, in normal operations, that just isn't acceptable, but given the volume, you know, this is a national uh, pandemic, and so you've got business owners across the country that have been impacted and that have applied for these programs. So naturally, uh, we've been impacted in terms both of our turnaround on these loans and also our responsiveness by our customer service folks. But if you call the, the 1-800 number, uh, you will... Uh, get access to your application information. They'll be able to tell you, uh, they'll be able to confirm that you know, everything's in the system and at least kind of broadly give you an idea of where you are in the process. Uh, if, the, if you haven't received a contact from a loan officer, uh, that's, the, that's kind of the second phase of the process. So you apply, you get an application number, and somewhere in that two, three week window, a loan officer should be in touch with you to verify information. And ultimately that gets you to the next phase where before disbursement. Uh, Wayne and Bonnie, if I could, I'll, I'll just interject the 800 number you're referring to. When 
when you get your application number on that uh, form that you can print, it, it is on there at the bottom. It's kind of small print, but I'll read it for the group here. Um, it's 800-659-2955. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks to you. And as a reminder, information that Wayne will share um, after this call will be posted for um, our participants. I just lost my questions. Hang on. Okay, Wayne, is the advance portion of the idle loan a taxable event? <laughs> Uh, good question. <laughs> Bonnie, we're going to have to get an answer to that one. I'm, I'm, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure, and, and I apologize, many, many apologies on that, but I'm not, not sure, but we'll get you a quick answer. Well, no, I appreciate that, and, and uh, you're, doing, you're doing a great job, Wayne. Hang in there. You're as good as the information that's being provided to you. <laughs> Sound like a curveball that might have come from the Emporia, the Emporia <laughs> channel. <laughs> uh, this is a little bit um, tricky question probably as well, not like the other ones have been uh, softballs, but do you anticipate 501c6s to be eligible for any type of federal PPP loan or other programs? At the moment, uh, well, if, if, you know, assuming the program stayed as is, then they would not be eligible. Uh, but we've had a lot of, again, there's been widespread interest in the question of uh, 501C6s has, has come up um, and, and we'll just have to wait and see if the program is modified at all. That's kind of a part of that qualifier that I mentioned early because this is a new, this was a new program, and I suspect with our legislators at the moment, there's a lot of negotiation. I know uh, there's some other industries that uh, perhaps are under consideration. So, so stay tuned. It, I, I think there's a chance that it could be expanded to include other sectors. Uh, and perhaps uh, that's where a 501c6 may may benefit. But but as is right now, the, the way the program had had been, uh, those entities could not participate. Thank you, Wayne. I know the Lawrence Chamber, and I'm sure the other communities have as well lobbied uh, on the federal level to include our organization. So let's let's continue to push that, and hopefully that does occur. Next question. If an organization uses the Kansas Shared Work Program, does that impact the PPP loan forgiveness? Well, I'm not sure. Um, I should be more familiar with the Kansas Shared Work Program, but I'm really not, I'm really not sure. Again, I, I'll, I'll defer back to the payroll costs, your average payroll costs that have been reflected over 12 months. Um, and, and if part of that had been, you know, the, the, the payroll share program, I mean, I think that's okay. Uh, what it really kind of gets down to are the number of employees that you've had and then those payroll costs. So they don't have to be the same employees, but I do believe the, the count of employees need to, need to match, uh, as to what you've had in that calculation for the loan. Thank you. And we have a question. Should people uh, still continue to apply? I assume they're talking about the PPP loan. And we talked about that earlier in the program. The answer to that was yes. Well, the, well the, and I want to clarify. So they're not, they, they're not applying directly to the SBA. So I would recommend reaching out to your lender and if the lender is still taking those applications, anticipating that there may be more uh, funding coming specifically for the program as is, 
I, I, all of that is okay. It's just that at the moment, SBA can no longer accept applications itself, um, which are submitted by the lenders. So SBA can no longer accept those applications because our appropriations has lapsed. Uh, but that, if the program stays uh, intact as is and receives more funding, then those lenders who have applications prepared and ready to submit would be better positioned than lenders who weren't collecting applications. And I hope all of that makes sense. It does make sense. And, you know, our banking friends and our SBA friends and everybody that's involved in the situation are doing the best they can. And it's, if you're needing funds, it's, it's frustrating. Um, and I understand that patience is, is uh, challenging because you have employees relying on you to pay their bills. And so it's a very stressful environment. But um, I do believe everybody's doing the best they can. So uh, another question. I'm an owner of a food truck and employee, con and employee contract laborers only. So is there any help out there for self-employers such as myself? Well, at the moment, our normal programming is in place. Uh, you could certainly reach out to, uh, I, would, I would encourage uh, a business owner in this category to reach out to the SBA. We've got micro loans available. Um, and in our normal programming, there are loan deferments that are at play. Uh, so there, there are resources. There are local revolving loan funds that uh, all of our communities have access to. Uh, so there, there are a number of groups you could reach out to, but if you just want to start simple, reach out to us, sba.gov. You've got the Kansas City office, depending on where you're located, or you've got the Wichita District office, and we'll try to get you matched up with a lender that can help. Uh, and uh, you can also reach out, just go, go into our website. We do have a lender, uh, a find a lender tool. Uh, so that one, under the payroll protection program, that was a, a tool that was in place on the website. But we also use a similar search tool, uh, as a, a program called Link, or Lender Match, I'm sorry. And under lender match, you put in simple criteria and uh, your location, and you get matched with lenders that, that are looking for clients with kind of the profile that you have. So if you need help with all that, just reach out to us. Uh, the contact information is going to be on the slides. Thank you, Wayne. And there was a question about some of you applied for an idle loan over a week ago, and they have not heard anything. Would your advice be to call that 800 number that was provided earlier? Yes, if you've received an application number, you wanna have that application number with you. Yes, call the 800 number. They can at least confirm that you're in the queue, you're in the system, and that someone will be in touch with you. It's probably gonna be a few weeks. Again, average time frame that we're seeing for, for that first contact is probably about three weeks. In, in this case, they have not received confirmation, so they do not have an application number. Do they, should they just wait for a while, or what would your advice be? My advice is gonna to be to call the 800 number because they can at least confirm if you're in the system or not. And if you're not in the system, you've gotta wait now because idle applications are no longer being accepted. So unless there's a new appropriations, you know, uh, under the CARES Act or uh, the new legislation that's now being negotiated, unless there's new funding, you can't apply for idle any longer. But if you start with the 800 number, you can find out if you're in fact in the system and uh, perhaps they can give you an application number and any other uh, information that would at least let you know you're, you're in the system and someone will be in touch with you later to discuss more details. Okay, perfect. 
Um, we're running out of time. This has been very helpful, but I have another question or two. It sounds like this, this individual did not receive um, some information from a narrative, but they did see a deposit in their account today for $1,000 per employee. So would this be an advance on the loan and not the grant? That is the, that is the idle advance. That is the idle advance. And under idle advance, uh, again, that is a, that's a forgivable grant. Uh, so when you're contacted by the loan officer, they will have more details and they'll be able to explain um, how that is ultimately able to be forgiven. Uh, so, and, and so let's say if the, if the scenario is this business owner did not apply for the PPP program, but they did just apply for idle uh, or the idle advance, they received that and they're still waiting uh, for additional funds, that loan officer will be in touch and uh, you'll learn more about how that is to be forgiven. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's finish on this question. I applied for a PPP with my bank last week and they are telling me that my application is in the SBA queue and that my loan docs would come from the SBA through DocuSign. My bank does not have physical locations. Does this, does this make sense or do you have other suggestions? Boy, I would, I, I recommend calling uh, the, the lender. Now the lenders will have, they could utilize their own note with this. And so perhaps uh, the lender's referring uh, to a note. There is, there, there was also an SBA note that, uh, came into play for, for the payroll protection program probably five days into the program being, being stood up. So I would, I'd recommend reaching out to that lender to find out more and to request those documents because if there's been an approval, um, they should know that and uh, they ought to be able to tell you how soon disbursement would occur. And, uh, and if it's just a matter of needing to, to sign off on the note, uh, then you know, that, that's something that can happen pretty quickly. But you, you, you get those loans through your lender, and if the lender's indicating that, they were, that you were approved, it should be really a pretty quick turnaround to getting the funds. Well, Wayne, thank you so much. I'm sure everybody else on the call uh, is giving you a standing ovation. You just can't see us all out here and high-fiving you. So uh, your knowledge and information is, is very helpful. Uh, we really appreciate you. For those on the call, I'd like to remind you that this presentation is being recorded and the information that Wayne provided on his uh, screen share will be posted by our local chambers by the end of the day or probably at least by tomorrow. Uh, additional follow-up questions that we discussed with Wayne will also be shared with you. So I want to thank everybody for participating. Thank you for the metal communities, Manhattan Emporia, Topeka, and Lawrence. And we are done with today's presentation. Thanks so much, Wayne, and everybody on the call. And we will see you on Tuesday. Be sure and register. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. I'll be in touch quick. All right. Thanks, Wayne.